Hi, it's Digital EU here, and we want to dig deeper into the many ways technology can make our world a better place and improve our lives. On today's agenda, the digital twin of our planet. So if you want to learn all about what it is, how it works, and what it can do, make sure to watch till the end. And I'm joined here today by two experts in this field, Irina Sandu and Peter Bauer from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Thank you for joining us today. And let's dive straight into it. So Destination Earth, a highly accurate uh, model of our planet. To me, as a non-expert, it sounds maybe a bit like a movie title or even like a Sims game, the meteorology edition, but it's definitely not a movie and it's certainly not a game. So what exactly is it? No, it's, it's very serious, actually, because we would like to have a better information system to understand the impacts of future climate change on our society and to manage adaptation measures, uh, for example, in response to that. The other uh, uh, side of the coin is uh, extreme weather. Uh, so we, we face extreme weather almost every day somewhere in the world. And we need better predictive capabilities uh, to deal with the consequences of that and protect our, our society. And so while this exists in parts today uh, in numerical weather prediction and operational services, the digital twins offer an entirely different view at this. And this is almost like a computer game in, in parts, as you were saying because you want an interactive system where you can play and in interact and, and trial out scenarios and ac action scenarios of, of what you can do in terms of your response to climate change or extremes. What are the three top areas in which Destination Earth, as the digital twin of our planet, can really have a massive impact on our lives, on our planet? What Destination Earth uh, will do in its first phase uh, will focus on extreme weather events and climate change and the high the first two high priority digital twins that the cmwf uh, is responsible for delivering are focusing on these two aspects so the first two digital twins focus on weather induced extremes and on climate change adaptation and they will uh, allow the users to study interactively different parts of the earth system to uh, better assess and monitor how weather and the climate, including the extreme events, are changing, but also to um, come up with adaptation measures for important sectors like uh, renewable energy, for example. Renewable energy is very important in uh, the green transition, and the first digital twins will provide information for sectors like this. That's a lot. So it's impressive that Destination Earth could do all of this. Um, how exactly does it work in practice? What's the process of this all? It's a huge collaborative effort. Uh, first of all, uh, there are three entities, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast, the European Space Agency and the European uh, Meteorological uh, Satellite Agency who are working together to implement the programme on behalf of the European Commission. We at TCMWF are responsible for providing, for delivering the first two digital twins and the software infrastructure to power these digital twins, which we call the digital twin engine. UMETSAT are responsible for what we call the data lake, which will contain all the data produced by the digital twins, but also other sources of data. And it, it, ESA will be responsible for what we call the core platform through which uh, users can interact with the data and can access the data from the digital twins. So it's a whole collaboration at European scale. We also collaborate, uh, all of us, with a lot of entities across uh, European countries. Uh, and we are going to uh, deliver destinationers in phases, in steps. Um, and we are now in the first phase. Okay, so it's done in phases, I understand. Of course, it's a lot of work. So how exactly, you say we're in the first phase, what comes next? Uh, so the, the first phase is clearly an implementation phase, you know? So we have to tell a story about what Destination Earth is trying to achieve, you know, as we've mm -hmm. just been discussing. Uh, so that's the ultimate goal, but we can only implement this in steps. So the first phase, the first two and a half years, which are funded right now, are uh, implementing the basic concepts and ideas. And they will be a bit insular, they're not fully connected yet. They don't uh, fulfill the entire ambition of you know, that interactivity and this high performance dream that we have. Um, 
The next phase is something we're discussing right now because we need to move from implementing bits and pieces to something that we can demonstrate in interconnected ways, you know, that we have sp specific use cases, let's say in renewable energy or, or flood forecasting or something like that, you know, and we can deploy this in Finland, in Italy, in Barcelona, and then a user that interfaces to the ESA platform can actually see all that and make that work together. And this is what the second phase is mostly about. You know, having these pieces come together, demonstrate the interactivity, some of the excellence already of what we're trying to achieve. But then it will take more phases in the future, the next seven years or something, or 10 years, uh, next seven to 10 years to, uh, you know, have the full singing and dancing uh, destination Earth uh, that can do everything we dream about. Okay, so this very exciting all singing and dancing destination Earth that you're talking about in seven to 10 years, will this be something that anyone can just play with or is it going to be just for experts still? That depends. <laughs> you know, I don't think you want, um, you know, my mother uh, interface with the system and occupy half of a supercomputer in Finland, you know, that costs uh, 150 million to buy and run. You need a certain tiered access where you say certain parts of the system would only be accessible to experts simply because it's safer to operate, it's the best, uh, it's, we invest a lot of money that needs to be managed in a controlled way. Um, other parts where it comes to when you move away from these uh, bigger infrastructures and it's really in user space, you know, where people can run something on an iPad, you know, an application that feeds data from destination Earth but doesn't really interact with it, with the entire infrastructure at least. You know, this you will certainly want everybody to use. What exactly uh, makes Destination Earth um, different to other digital twins? It's really this notion of digital twins, you know, which are, of course, better models. You know, we want the, the, the highest possible accuracy uh, of the digital representation of our world. But there's two other factors that are really, really important. And one is the uh, connectivity between the physical world and the human world. You know, rainfall prediction or rainfall observation is important. But what does it mean in terms of flooding or flood risk, you know? So what, what matters to us, that connection is a differentiating factor. And we want to build in the application into the physical uh, representation of the world. So it's a physical plus human world. That connectivity is new. And lastly is that interactivity, you know? Uh, present information systems uh, have predefined cycles and setups and they pour out information and the data can be picked up. We do this every day in uh, numerical weather prediction. In the digital twin, you can interact with it. You can rerun with different scenarios and different settings. And you can say, if I change my flood protection in the Netherlands, you know, what actually happens to the flooding after that, you know? So you can actually manipulate the system and ask specific questions. And that interactivity is the really, really new factor. So you mentioned a lot of organizations and entities, and I was wondering how does Destination Earth fit in this uh, wide landscape? So while Destination Earth is a self-contained project about digital twins, you know, it has to be placed within the ecosystem of uh, adjacent activities uh, uh, that relate to services, for example, environmental services provided by Copernicus, by National Met Services, for example. So they will do their business. They have a very well-established well community and uh, procedures to do that. You have big technology uh, activities in Europe. Your HPC is an example, Quantum is an example. At the same time, you have a huge research program, research and innovation program actually under the European Com Commission. And Destination Earth requires input from all of those, but also has potential to feed into those. You know? So it's really a synergetic setup uh, that we require for Destination Earth to be successful. This sounds incredibly exciting. What message would you have to say um, a young scientist watching this right now who would say this is an interesting project I would like to be part of? I would say come and join us and work with us. It's a Destination Earth is truly exciting because it combines um, advances in di digital technologies with um, advances in science, in Earth system and computing science. And um, in doing that, it's trying to uh, make the world a better uh, and a safer place. Uh, for young people, you know, you work with the coolest uh, digital technology in Europe. Uh, you work in an international framework uh, and you work on topics that matter for society's future. What's not to like? 
Well, you heard them. So if you're interested, please head over to our website. You can find it linked below. And thank you so much, uh, Irina and Peter, for joining us today and for explaining Destination Earth to us in our first episode of this new series. Let's see what the next one brings. Thank Thanks, you so Scott. much. Pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.